yes, he has connected to the Lord is good. And we want to welcome you, our pastor, uh, our mentor for this morning. The Lord may use you, may the spirit of the Lord be upon you as you continue to speak to you, the children of God. Uh, Dr. Mbiriri, this is your time now. We have already prayed for you. Uh, thank you so much. We praise the Lord for his uh, mercies that are new every morning. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning to everyone. May God bless you and your families, keeping you sheltered under his wings uh, during these difficult times that we are going through. So today uh, we are going to uh, read uh, from the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 4, 2 Kings, chapter 4. Uh, that's where we are going to uh, to focus on uh, Second Kings chapter four, verse from verse number one. We have an experience that's recorded there, an experience of um, a lady who was talking to the man of God, Elisha, and uh, this lady was in distress. She was in distress. Yes. Uh, so the Bible says. Second Kings chapter four, verse number one. Uh, a certain woman, thank you uh, to whoever has put it up on the screen here. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, that is my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and uh, the creditor is coming to take my sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you, ma'am? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, well, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, that is Elisha, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather just a few, but, uh, okay, so do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and uh, your sons, then, then pour it into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went and she did as she was told, a problem was solved. Now, this is basically what I want us to focus our attention on and try to glean a principle or two that could help us. Now, I think we've, many of us have been there with this woman, the position from which this woman was talking. She was in, in, in economic or financial distress. She was so distressed because of the situation that she was in. Number one, she had uh, just lost her husband, but then the husband owed somebody a huge sum of money and she had no means to pay this. Now she was being threatened with having her sons being taken and put into slavery. And so she was in no, I mean, she was in serious distress. She had, had already lost her husband. Now she's about to lose the two sons. In other words, her life was uh, falling apart. Uh, like Chinua Achebe titled one of his books, things fall apart. Things were falling apart in her life. And so uh, in that kind of distress, she had an encounter with the man of God, Elisha. And she said, this is what's happening. And I don't know what to do about my situation. And Elisha looked just squarely in, the, in her face, their, their eyes locked. And Elisha said, please, ma'am, may you tell me, please tell me, uh, what, is, what can I do for you? How can I help you? Now, uh, what do you have in your house? What is it that you have in your house? And she said, well, I have nothing. You know, if I had something I, that could help this situation, I don't think I would be bothering you about my case. I have nothing. And then almost as an afterthought, she said, uh, well, except some oil that's actually about to run out. <laughs> that's all I have. Elijah says, enough. That's enough. That's enough solution you have the solution already and it's right where in it's right there in the house 
where you are coming from, where this poverty, where this financial distress is a resident, where this uh, situation of, uh, of insolvency has found its address in that same locale, in that same house, that is where the solution is to uh, also resolve your situation. So if you say you've got a little oil, which is about to run out, that's enough. And so she's given instructions of what she's supposed to do. Go and uh, borrow as many vessels from her neighbors. Go back into that same house where the poverty is residing, where that situation is obtaining. And he says, shut the door behind you. And then uh, you're going to pour into all the vessels. And he said, please just make sure you do not borrow a few vessels. Make sure you borrow as many as you can find. And so she did just that. By the end of the day, a problem was solved. She was able to service her debt or the mortgage. She was able to service that. And after that, uh, she had so much left over to live on with his kind of situation. This is the situation that this lady was uh, found herself in. And so we find here, brothers and sisters, that uh, God, through Elisha, solves a problem from what she already had, from the resources that were there, but which to her didn't mean anything and could not solve a situation. Because when she was asked, what do you have? Their first response was nothing, nothing. And it was only as an afterthought, maybe after Elisha made uh, you know, a, a, a strategic pause and looked at her with a look that said, really, really? You really have nothing? Are you sure that you have nothing? What, you know, that kind of inquisitive look that was in Elisha's eyes, probably that is the one that eventually uh, coaxed there into saying, oh, except uh, some oil and it's about to run out. I mean, so it's actually useless. We, we can't be talking about it because there's no point. But what I want to say, my brothers and sisters, is that uh, God, uh, you know, the book of Proverbs chapter seven should be about verse 29, tells us that God made man upright or God created man simple but man has sought many inventions, many inventions. Now, the thought is, okay, let me put it this way. Do, do you know that in the Bible, whether you're reading from the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's no word for unemployment. There's nothing like that. There's no word for unemployment. The only thing that you can ever encounter at most is laziness. When the, like the Proverbs chapter six says that go to the end, you sluggard, learn a ways and things like that. If someone doesn't want to work, they should not eat. That's Paul when he writes, you know, there's no word like unemployment in the Bible. If they're only lazy people, no unemployment. Now, but we have created, you know, this thing called unemployment is something of our own making as humanity because of economic systems that we've set up, which include and exclude others. You know, some people are in and others are out and something like that. And then you go home, you're so sad and, you know, so frustrated, feeling so useless, low self-esteem, I'm unemployed, nobody's taking me and things like that. The, the Bible says, uh, okay, what, what do you have in your house? What is it that is near you? What is it that is around you? There are many problems that God solved in the Bible this way. For example, when you look at Moses, uh, the Israelites were languishing in slavery in Egypt. They were languishing in slavery. They didn't know how to get out of this place. And God meets Moses at the burning bush at Horeb. And he says, Moses, you are the deliverer. I've come down to rescue my people out, but you're the one to do it. And Moses is almost you know, jumps out of his skin and he says, God, are you serious? How do I confront the Pharaoh? This is a superpower. You know, Egypt was a superpower at that time. And says, how do I do that? And says, okay, what do you have in your hand? Says, oh, of course, a simple shepherd's rod. Says, that's enough. 
you put it down and immediately it metamorphosed into a vicious Egyptian cobra slithering on the hot sands and Mo Moses took off and says, this is disaster. I'm going to die. This is a venomous, vicious snake. And God says, stop right where you are and says, go back, retrace the steps and pick it by the tail. In other words, there is a power right in your hands. There is so much power. And God says, I will use what is nearest, what is in your hands. That's what I will use. And uh, we, we know the other time that most uh, God, Jesus, he had such a large multitude of hungry mouths. In this, people needed food. And the disciples were busy calculating how much it would cost to feed such a huge crowd, excluding uh, women and children. There was about 5,000 men. And you know that in church, there are more women than, uh, than men, more women. So that crowd could have been over 20,000, made over 20,000. And so these people were so hungry. And Jesus, uh, you know, says to his disciples, no, we're not going to send them away. You are the one to feed them. And says, they say, what do you mean? How do we feed them? I mean, are we also faced with the situation in our homes? Man mouths that need some feeding and with no clue how they can be fed, how they can be satisfied. But Jesus says to his disciples, you need to feed them. And so they say, no, we have nothing except just these uh, uh, you know, five loaves, you know, the five rolls, really, not loaves like in the standard loaf of bread, uh, but five rolls, you know, like the rolls. And, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then we've got some little fishes, you know, five of them, and so on. Jesus says, that's enough. Make the people sit down. That's enough. In other words, from what is there, God works out a miracle to feed the multitudes. And God has done this Time and time again, looks like it's his method. You know, some of us here are in distress, like this lady was, stressed up because of the situation uh, that we find ourselves in. But God's method has always been that he uses what is available, what is nearest to us. And so let me say, my brothers and sisters, that uh, like these disciples, like that woman, like Moses, it's easy to say that, well, I have nothing. I have nothing. That's why I'm in this situation. I have nothing. But really, is it true that you have nothing? Is it really true that you have nothing? Or maybe it's a mindset that discounts or that does not see value in the little that is around you. I mean, to open our eyes and look, look at things around us or nearest us, in a different way. I'm talking about, for example, some of us may be, you know, uh, we're in distress in the cities, in the urban areas and everything like that, you know, living hand to mouth, literally. But some of us have got uh, so much land and resources, even water, rivers that flow through our properties in the countryside. And we don't see that as anything of value. We don't see it as anything of value because my education system said, get good grades, go to the city, apply for a job, and then you get employed. Some of us, you will never see that you are a millionaire, but you don't see the millions in your, in your rural property. And some of us have got even farms and yet uh, farms that maybe were acquired by fathers or grandparents, but we don't see them. None of the children works on those farms. You know, those farms are just lying there dilapidated and, you know, they are abandoned and disused. And yet we are at the same time, our children are unemployed. We are stressed. We have got all this. And when God says, why are you in this situation? What do you have? We say, well, God, I have nothing. I have nothing. And what you call something, is what the world has told you that this is what something looks like. And the things, the resources that God has placed nearest you, you don't see them as anything. I'm saying God can use the simple things that we already possess to confront, confront the pharaohs of unemployment and to confront whatever situations and that is causing a sleeplessness and distress 
Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm talking about that man, Sanders. You know, the one who started KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, that man started that company in his, he was already in his 60s. He had just been uh, retired. And he had very little amount of money that was paid as a uh, termination benefits or whatever, you know, uh, after he got, and he was stressed. He didn't know what to do with it. The money was so little. It was a meager amount of money. And in his stress and in his desperation, he thought of a recipe of making chicken that his grandmother had taught him long before she passed away. He had almost forgotten about that recipe. And he started from the little recipe that his grandmother uh, gave him when he was still a young man. And it is that recipe that has brought KFC even into South Africa. It is that recipe, something that was already nearest him, something that was already close to where he is. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm talking about the people that have made amazing breakthroughs, even in the South African economy. I know of a sister, I'm not sure if she's on the platform tonight, I mean, uh, this morning. Uh, and so, you know, using the old method of just making something that has always been made, if she allows me, you know, just peanut butter, peanut butter. And maybe you have bought it. Maybe you have, you have some of the people that have enjoyed that. But that is something that is already, that was already lying nearest to where she is. I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, we need sometimes, all we need is a paradigm shift. And the thing happens. It is a paradigm shift. You know, sometimes you're so frustrated and say, oh, so why can people do something like this? Like she used to look for peanut butter that, uh, that is the traditional taste that she was used to, but she couldn't find this peanut butter in the shops uh, in South Africa. And she says, well, mm, why can't I make it? Some, using something that is already there and already known. It is something that is already nearest, you know? Uh, you know, the discover, I'm not saying we should drink coffee, but the discovery of coffee, you know, coffee was first discovered uh, in, 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 in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia. And these shepherds taking care of their goats and everything, they would notice that the goats were fond of eating from this particular tree. But whenever they did, after they did, they were so hyperactive and everything like that. And that is eventually how coffee is discovered and it becomes a multi-million dollar something around the world and so on and so on. Right now, people are going into Ethiopia and they are taking you know, their traditional uh, food in Jera and it's becoming a multi-million dollar thing. Right now, people are getting boabs from Africa and it's becoming a multi-million dollar something in Europe. And so things that are already nearest, you know, I, sometimes I feel like when God looks at Africa, he says, Africa, what more could I have done for you? What more could I have done for you? I don't think there's a continent on this planet that was as highly favored with the resources the way Africa was. God did Africa many favors, but only the African doesn't see that. He doesn't. <laughs> he thinks that all the opportunities are everywhere else. And then he goes... You know, I'm not saying it's bad, it's wrong to go to other places and work from there and function from there. But I'm saying that sometimes we suffer unnecessarily when the resources are staring us in the face. What we may need is just that shift of mindset. And so to pray for that Damascene experience, God, for that, so that we, we have a mindset that is different and we can capitalize on the resources that we have. The other time I was in one of our neighboring countries here, uh, you know, and I, I was just commending them, you know, for the good bream that they have this fish. And one of them said, pastor, I wish these fish were coming from our country. I said, what do you mean? And you know, tilapia. And he was, he said about 60% of our tilapia are imported from China. I said, China, are you serious? What do you mean that you import tilapia from China? And he said, way back in the 1960s, when uh, this, a major railway was being built in their country, uh, some of the people who worked on that railway, railway line were Chinese. They observed these fish in, uh, in, in one part of that country, in the rivers. 
And they said, wow, this is very good fish. They took the fish to China. They now must produce and export back to this country, right here in Sadak. I said to them, oh my goodness. You know, if these were computer chips and so on, we would say, maybe we don't know how to make them. But God already made the fish. And now we have to import from China. Oh, come on, come on. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, the other time, flying into Kuala Lumpur, I, I remarked to some, uh, you know, Malaysian, Malaysian friends and said, all these palm oil trees and everything like that. And, you know, Malaysia, I know that for some time they were the largest export of palm oil. And so I remember, how, did, how do you do it? And so, and they said the palm oil, we first discovered these in West Africa. And so they imported from uh, Nigeria and into, and they became the largest exporter of palm oil. You know, you don't have to make the palm oil tree. God already made it. And it's already here in Africa, but we have to import our palm oil from Malaysia. <laughs> you know, uh, this, the kind of things that, and I know that some of these things, we need to have large scales to do them. But there are other things that we, we need to do, we can do in our own, uh, you know, within our own families, in our own ways, things that we can do, uh, that we don't need the government to be in, that we can already do. And so uh, the Bible tells us about uh, the importance, you know, uh, this is the last text that I'm reading from the book of Proverbs. From the book of Proverbs, uh, verse number, I mean, chapter 27, the Bible says here from verse number uh, 26, the lambs are for your clothing and the goats are the price of the field and you shall have goats milk enough for your food, for the food of your household and for the maintenance of your maidens. In fact, let's allow me to read from verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. Okay, be thou diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your heads. In other words, yes, for the for riches are not forever, and there's a crown endure to every generation. The hay appears and the tender grass shows itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lamps are for your clothing and the goats are the price of the field. You shall have goats milk enough for your food, for the food of your household and for the maintenance of your maidens. The Bible says here, the simple things that we may overlook, the simple things like goats. And the Bible says goats can have, give you enough money to pay for your clothes. You can even buy real estate, you know, you use from gods and you can pay your, you can have servants, you can pay them from gods. I'm not sure whether he was thinking about Boa gods uh, when this text was written. I'm not sure whether that is what you are thinking about. And some of you, yeah, they're in South Africa. Some of you, you are South Africans and you are saying, I have nothing. And some people here in Zimbabwe are making millions from Boa gods, which are from South Africa. And people around the world are importing Boa goats from South Africa. And you know, the red color Hari and so on and so on. These are, I, I, but I'm simply saying the Bible is saying, you don't have to create the God. It's already created. And God is saying, don't overlook these resources because out of them, you can make your life, you, your life can be changed. So God looks at us sometimes praying, making long prayers and saying, I'm in poverty. God says, I mean, why are you bothering me? I already gave you whatever is needed. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray, but I'm saying we should also have a mindset that is open to see the things that God has already done for us. Let me close with this. I have a friend here in Zimbabwe. He runs a nursery. He does fruit trees, fruit trees. And so I wanted to know, because it does them on a big scale, working with NGOs and schools and so on and so on. And I said, how do you do this? He goes to Mbare Musika, that is our largest vegetable market in Harare. And he collects, you know, uh, like, you know, when people throw away um, rotten um, avocados and mangoes and whatever and so on, and he collects these. It is from these thrown away, uh, you know, <laughs> fruits that he makes his necessaries. He makes his necessaries. And you know, 
this is thing, stuff that people are seeing as trash, as debt, and he runs his organization from trash. Things that people have thrown away. In other words, the resources are everywhere. It's only our mindset sometimes that need uh, some tinkering. Elisha's question was, what is in your house? And what is in your house? May you think about that. What's in your family? What resources could actually be lying nearest you? You are crying for employment when you're a potential employer, you know? And I'm not saying it's wrong to be employed, but I'm saying it's not good for us to overlook the resources that are already available to us and we don't utilize them. May God bless us as we think about these things and may God help us whatever situations we might be. Let us close our eyes in prayer. Our kind and most gracious heavenly father, may glory and honor come to you, Lord, for only you are worthy to be praised. Just want to thank you for the time that you've given us, speaking to us from your word. I want to pray, Lord, for brother or sister who may be in distress the way this lady was. I pray that you may open our eyes so that we may see things we never saw before. Because some things are there, but unless and until you open our eyes, we may never see them. And may you help us to capitalize on those things that are nearest us so that uh, we do not only solve our problems, but we can actually create value for others. And I want to thank you and to praise you for every one of us that you may keep us sheltered under your wings during these evil times. Some of us have lost our loved ones and our friends and uh, acquaintances. I pray for your comforting presence to be with us. Some have been disturbed because of the disturbances that have been taking place uh, in parts of South Africa. I pray that you may come through for us, dear Lord. May your name be praised. May your name be glorified as we pray for peace, love, and calm in South Africa and in other parts of the world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.